Today, or tonight I should say, we should begin a series called Four Reasons Why You Should Consider Christianity This Christmas. And it kicks off with our first reason tonight. Because it's historically valid. Uh, let me just begin by just quickly saying four things. Number one, <clears throat> we're glad you're all here. Uh, wherever you sit on the spectrum of faith, whether you're a strong Christian or a sort of a fence sitter or a real skeptical atheist, wherever you are, we're really glad uh, you're here. Uh, number two, <clears throat> we want to sympathise with the non-believer at the boathouse. We understand that Christianity has massive claims and things you don't see normally every day, like a man walking on water or a resurrection or something like that. We know these are far-fetched claims and we kind of understand that people can be cynical, skeptical, doubting. Even if you're a Christian, some of us in this room go through doubts and uh, confusion and we have our questions and that is okay. We totally want to sympathise with you. I'm sceptical sometimes and I need my brain and my faith rebooted again and again and again. I'm a total pessimist if you've ever had uh, anything to do with me. I'm always looking at the glass that's half full, it's half empty. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm pessimistic about anything, sceptical, cynical about a whole range of things. And so we sympathise with you. Uh, thirdly, <clears throat> Tonight's talk, especially I think, can I ask you to sympathise with us as Christians if you're a non-Christian? If you're a doubter, or if you're looking or uh, he listening to this online, so we're filming the talks and uh, going to post them online. If you're one of those people who uh, is pretty hard on Christians, can I say, can you go easy on us, particularly in this area of historicity? It's very hard to kind of get all this information out about Jesus that we would really love. I mean, it would make my job a lot easier if I could just bring to the party uh, all the information I could possibly muster, all the proof, all the data, but I simply can't. In fact, no Christian can. Uh, and that is because it happened so long ago, 2,000 years ago. And what I want to say to the doubter and the skeptic, particularly someone who's very cynical towards Christians and the whole, whole thing of proof, and they say, oh, I can't believe there's just not enough proof. Can I say that if you have that view, then you probably have to cancel out just about anything from the ancient world. There's so much from the ancient world that we don't have very much proof for, but most of us just take for granted that it really happened or those people existed. Uh, take, for example, Cleopatra, Cleopatra VII, the most famous Cleopatra. Queen of Egypt, regarded as one of the most beautiful women of antiquity. Uh, we still don't know where she's buried. We haven't found her grave. We think it's possibly in Alexandria, but we still haven't found it. All these people digging around the Indiana Joneses of the world still haven't found her grave, and yet this famous woman existed. Uh, the Battle of Actium, one of the great naval, naval battles of antiquity uh, between Mark Antony and Octavian. And yet, still no real concrete proof that this battle ever happened. We know it from a number of written sources, but no archaeological evidence whatsoever, no boat, no oar. Maybe the one or two rocks that might have been used as cannonballs or slings or something like that in, in, in the time that this happened, but nothing really conclusive. And yet it was one of the most famous naval battles of antiquity. Tiberius, the second Caesar. We have documents from all sorts of people from all over the ancient world, documents like shopping lists, birthday invites, uh, people just taking notes, um, people exchanging uh, uh, various things to do with a business transaction. We've got hundreds of things, letters from all over, from just the most commonest people. We don't have one personal correspondence of Tiberius in the world, nothing. And yet he was the emperor of Rome. And just last of all, Shakespeare, one of England's great sons. 
We don't know still when Shakespeare was born. No one knows. We can have a good guess at the year because we've got a baptismal um, registry entry. So we know when he was baptised and where, but we still don't know exactly when he was born. So it's very hard to celebrate the birthday of Shakespeare. And there's someone so famous who only lived about 500 years ago. What I'm trying to say is that it's very hard to get all the data that makes, you know, I don't have a silver bullet for you uh, tonight. Uh, but I do hope that these, th this talk tonight uh, does give you some... Um, helps you see that at least there's some credibility to the historicity of Christianity. And then uh, fourthly, <clears throat> I just want to say that the aim of these talks, and this one in particular, is not just an intellectual exercise. It's to help you have real hope real love, real faith. Uh, as it was mentioned in the notices, we've had a, a tough couple of months. And I want to be able to look at Ruth and Tom in the eye and Ricky and Liesl going through such hard times and say, you know what, we do have substantial proof to say that Jesus really did come. He really did live. He really did these things. And he really did rise from the dead. And I want to look at people in their darkest hour, in hospitals, when they're beside the deathbed of an infant or their own death, and to look at them and say, I am confident in the truth of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's all about. And to that end, I want to say, all these talks are meant to be friendly. It's not Christians versus the atheists, the believers versus the skeptics. This is, we found something. We think that something amazing happened 2,000 years ago and there's substantial evidence to, show, to, to give you faith, to help you believe, if only you would investigate a little further. And so I'm hoping that this talk and the other ones help you it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's to help you here and help you in life. Um, yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do then is give you some historical reasons why I am a Christian, why I think you should at least reconsider Christianity this Christmas. And the way I'm going to do it uh, this evening is just look at the first four verses of Luke's Gospel, that first reading, which you should have in front of you, but I'll have it on the screen. Uh, as m many of you would know, there are four biographies in the New Testament uh, written by four men and the authors uh, uh, are what, how we title those books. So we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They're the authors of the biographies on uh, Jesus. Luke was uh, a doctor, a physician of some sort. Uh, he got converted later on. He's, uh, he's not one of the, the twelve, one of the twelve disciples. He is a sort of second generation Christian, if you like, getting converted maybe about ten years, fifteen years after Jesus was uh, crucified and resurrected. Uh, but got converted and then began to interview uh, the followers of Jesus, the first followers of Jesus, and he compiles a two-volume account that we have in the New Testament on the events of Jesus' life, his death and resurrection, and then a second volume called the Book of Acts, which we've been studying here over the last two years. It's an account of the early church, the first 30 years of Christendom. And he is the biggest contributor to the New Testament with all his... Uh, Two big, two big books. Uh, he made, he's, he's the biggest contributor to the New Testament. He lived till he was 84, apparently, um, and, uh, and, and died a single man. And these are the opening words from the Gospel. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now, I've got seven things for you this evening. And this first verse has, I think, three of them. Here's the first one. Reason number one why I believe the Bible is historically valid, or the New Testament anyway. There are so many sources on Christianity. 
Luke himself here says many have undertaken to draw up an account. There's been numerous people who have started to write about Jesus. Now we don't have all those sources, all those early accounts, all those early biographies on Jesus, but we do have some. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the first four books of the New Testament who write a biography on Jesus. They are some of the sources that we have. Uh, Luke was probably already aware of Mark's Gospel before he wrote his own. In fact, he uses portions of Mark's Gospel in his own Gospel. But he writes independently, in a sense, from Mark as well, including stuff that Mark doesn't have. Um, And beyond that, we have these other books of the New Testament, the book of Acts I've mentioned, which Luke also wrote, that tell us about Jesus and the early church. And then 13 letters that Paul wrote to the early churches, to Christians in the first century. They tell us about Jesus and the early Christians. So they count as other sources on early Christianity. And then add to that a further nine books to make up 27 of the New Testament. These are all regarded in some ways as different independent sources. And this is good for historians because this is... Uh, They call this the criterion of multiple attestation. That it can be attested through multiple sources. We've got different people writing in different times, different uh, decades at least, uh, about different parts of Christianity. And this is very helpful for historians to see, look, Christianity is not based on just one thing, one source. We've got many sources on, Christiani- uh, on early Christianity. It doesn't just come down to one person, one book, one letter, one person's view. We've got many written sources. And then you can add to this a whole lot of other things as well. The very fact is that Paul wrote his, all his epistles before Luke wrote his Gospel. In fact, all four Gospels were written after Paul wrote his letters. So, within Paul's letters, there are, there's information on Jesus and how people saw Jesus that e- existed. So, Ma, uh, Luke might have been referring to something that Paul was writing about when he says there are many people who are writing about Jesus. And then we can add to this hundreds of references to Jesus in Christian writings and even non-Christian writings, Roman writers, Jewish writers, who write about Jesus and the early Christians. We have many, many sources on first century Christianity. Uh, That is eye-opening to historians. So many have undertaken We've got a number of sources on the life of Jesus and the early Christians. Here's the next uh, 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 reason. The style of writing is historical. Many have undertaken to draw up an account. To draw up an account. I was told, uh, maybe early on in my Christian faith, that the Gospel writers wrote their Gospels in a way that wasn't meant to be taken literally. I don't know if you've come across this idea, this theory, that they were just writing symbolically. And so when they talk about Jesus casting out demons into pigs and the pigs running down the hill and everything, we're not meant to really actually think of evil spirits and like something out of a horror movie and literally pigs running down a hill into a lake and things like that. This was all symbolic language of talking about the culture and something very tangible in Jesus' day. An Australian woman by the name of Barbara Thiering popularised this idea that the Gospels weren't meant to be taken literally, just symbolically. And she published a number of books and they sold like wildfire because um, it, it it was just this new interesting idea and she just made it very popular. But it gained no weight in scholarly circles whatsoever. And one of the reasons is, is because the Gospel writers are writing in a style that was, you can easily tell that they weren't writing in a way that said, oh, you're meant to be taking this figuratively or 
symbolically. Many have undertaken to draw up an account. When a writer from the ancient world uses the word account here, the Greek word for account was only ever used when you were writing about history, not myth, legend, or you were writing about something symbolically. Nowhere can we find from antiquity someone using that word when they were trying to get their audience, or their readers, to kind of interpret it symbolically or metaphorically. So uh, the accounts of Jesus are all written in a style that tells us we're supposed to take it literally real. So that really cancels out this whole idea that, oh, maybe it was all meant to be taken, uh, you know, uh, symbolically. Uh, the next reason, <clears throat> reason number three, the date of the writing. The date of the writing is contemporary to some degree. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of, account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. I used to get told as well, and you might read this in some of the, the books by the New Atheists, that the Gospels were composed 100, 150, 200 years later. That's not true. They were written within a generation of the events happening. Luke says, many have undertaken to drop th the things uh, that have been fulfilled among us. Not in a, a galaxy far, far away, a long, long time ago. He doesn't say once upon a time. He's saying these things have been fulfilled in our time. I'm writing in an era where you could go and check it out for yourself. Uh, maybe this uh, might help you. The ministry of Jesus, uh, the latest consensus is that he uh, began his ministry in AD 28 and was crucified, resurrected in AD 30. And then for about 30 years, Christians began to speak about uh, Jesus, um, perhaps writing a few things down. But the final composition of the Gospels began in the 60s through to the 70s and perhaps maybe a, a little bit beyond that into the uh, late 70s, 80s in some people's view. But that only is a 30 year gap between the events and then writing down in the form that we have them now, a 30 to 40 year gap. That is very impressive. Most of the stuff you read about Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra was written many, many decades, sometimes over a hundred years later, or by people that never actually met, met those people. The authors never met anyone close to Cleopatra or Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great. But Luke lived and wrote in a time where you could go and check things out. This is actually very close. I know it doesn't seem to, very close to us as moderns, but it's not far at all when you're talking about ancient writers and many of us who are old enough can remember what we were doing 30 years ago. I can remember what I was doing, exactly what I was doing, who I was speaking to on a phone, what I was wearing, where I was, the position of my body. I can remember everything. I can remember the weather of the day, what I was doing 30 years ago to the date on the 28th of January. I got a phone call at about 8 o'clock in the morning from a friend who woke me up. He's the bass player in the band I used to play in. He asked me, have I seen the news yet? I said, no, I'm still in bed. That's why I can remember I was horizontal. I said, what has happened? He said, go downstairs and turn on the television. Why? What's happened? The space shuttle Challenger has just taken off and blown up 73 seconds after takeoff. And I ran downstairs and every station was playing repeats of that space shuttle blowing up in the face of science. I can remember it, clear as, 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 as anything. It's not hard for the disciples and the followers of Jesus to remember Jesus walking on water or him rising from the dead or healing someone or him calming a storm. And even to remember the things that he said. I mean, if you really now believe that he's the Son of God, that he's God incarnate in some form, you're going to pay attention. And can I just add to this also? It's very interesting. The Gospels, even though they're quite long, are actually composed of tiny little stories. 
all in memorable sort of formulas. Most of the miracles only last about seven to ten verses. Some of them are shorter. In other words, they seem to be in these little memorable bite-size uh, formulas almost that anyone could recite and remember and then at a certain stage they began to write them down in the final form. And by the way, Luke probably wrote earlier drafts of his gospel earlier on till the final form in the 60s or 70s when he, when he wrote it. So the date is very, very impressive to historians. So many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Here's the next reason, reason number four. There were many eyewitnesses. We don't just have many sources, but we've actually got many eyewitnesses to what happened with Jesus. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. There were many credible people who saw with their own eyes. It didn't happen all in a dark room or behind a curtain. It happened in front. It was very, Jesus' ministry was very public. I mean, feeding the 5,000, how many people are involved there? <laughs> Not just the 5,000 who are fed because they only counted the men. There could have been as many as 10,000 people who witnessed that if you counted women and children as well. Many people saw him raise people from the dead or uh, heal uh, people in various ways. They saw it with their own eyes. In fact, Luke is using a medical term here. This word eyewitness is a Greek word, autoptai. It takes two words, auto and opus. Auto means self, opus is I. Those who saw with their own eye. And being a physician, this is a medical term. It's the word we get autopsy from. Those who opened up the patient and saw with their own eyes. That's who I've interviewed. They were, they're the people who have, have given me this information. They were handed down to us by those who from the first... So Luke himself wasn't an eyewitness. He became a Christian about 15 years later. But he's interviewed. He's gone to the eyewitnesses. Not second-class earwitnesses, but first-class eyewitnesses. And one of them is John. John was one of the apostles, one of the people that hung around with Jesus the whole time of his ministry. And that brings us to our second reading, in fact. John writes a letter in the New Testament that begins the, with these words. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We've seen it. And testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Do you see this? He's saying we saw, we, we, we were there. We saw this happen. We saw it with our own eyes. Reason number five. The death of these witnesses. Now, you don't have anything in the reading here, but Luke will go on to tell us about the death of some of the first followers of Jesus. Um, it is very impressive to me, one of the big things to me, is that these witnesses, these eyewitnesses, went to the grave all the way to their death saying, we saw this. We're not recanting. Uh, Judas, we think, com committed suicide uh, from what we read in the New Testament, uh, hung himself. <clears throat> uh, John, who, uh, who wrote uh, the words you, you have before you, uh, died a natural death. But the other ten apostles were all martyred for their faith. <coughs> Andrew was crucified in an X position. Peter crucified upside down in Rome. Uh, Paul beheaded and others were as well and others were tortured to death and the thing is this wasn't a kind of like a, a suicide bomber going to death for a cause 
or for nationalism or for the pride of religion or uh, that they might get 70 virgins or something like that. This was people going, saying, I can't recant because this is true. I saw it with my own eyes. This really happened. So many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Reason number six, I've only got seven, the accuracy of the accounts. The accuracy of the accounts. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you I've investigated everything carefully and we've got that in in the rest of Luke's gospel how we see how he's given us dates and place names and all sorts of things in um, in in Luke's gospel <laughs> he gives us all this data to say look here go and check it out I've given you all this information and you can see how he's researched carefully. And can I just say, <clears throat> without hopefully not boasting, I've done my homework on it as well. I have read and read and read. I have dragged my wife all around the world to find all sorts of places. Uh, I've been to Israel eight times now. I have led tours there. I, we've been to Ephesus. Um, we've been to all these places just about mentioned in Egypt in the Bible and part of the reason for holidaying there I'll come clean Karen part of the reason is not just to lie in a sunbed but to go and find stuff and in 2012 I went on an archaeological dig in Galilee digging with people from all around the world uh, led by this man Rami Arif appearing here on the Discovering channel he was the leader of our archaeological dig and here we are I was digging in a first century uh, home where possibly Jesus or the Apostles might have hung out lived had a relative I don't know Bethsaida is not a very big town and there's a student in between the two of us there in this picture and the guy on the left there he's a surfer from California but he's also a doctor lecturer of ancient history um, and what I could gather I think not a Christian but interested in first century Christianity and he was doing a lot of work he's a marine archaeologist doing a lot of work on a, a Galilean boat guys look I don't want to bore you too much about this but I could show you so many things there <laughs> scholars Christian scholars um, and secular scholars could show you actually the validity of the New Testament really holds up Here's a stone with Pontius Pilate's name on it. It's, it's archaeological evidence that he existed, not just written sources. Some of the new atheists have said that Jews were never crucified in the first century. They were only stoned. <coughs> Jews were some of the most crucified people of antiquity. And here in Jerusalem, in a grave, we found a nail through the ankle bone of a victim. A Jewish burial box with that in it. There's archaeological evidence that Jews were crucified, not stoned. Caiaphas was the high priest that we read about in the New Testament. Here is his burial box, a little ossuary that is about this big, where his bones, after about a year of decom decomposing, would be put into that box and buried. We have his burial box. Now we're going to see this, the Cyrus Cylinder, when you come on, uh, uh, on Saturday, if you come with the Brit to the British Museum with me, verifying things about Cyrus and so on. And this last of all, <coughs> uh, people didn't know where the Pool of Siloam was. We, we had a fair idea, but we, couldn't, we had no archaeological uh, concrete evidence of it until a number of uh, people were putting in a sewage system in this part of Jerusalem. And as they uncovered it, they found these stairs. And they found, this is only not so long ago, uh, the pool of Siloam. Um, look, there's many more, including, of course, all the manuscript evidence, like thousands of manuscripts, that we have early copies of uh, the New Testament. 
So look, I, I've done my homework on it as well, and, and Luke has as well. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now, look at the next verse. You don't have it on your sheet, but look at the next verse. Verse 5 in his biography. He goes on to say, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. He's giving us names, geographical place, place names. He's giving us the titles of people like Herod the king, Zechariah the priest, Elizabeth the wife, and so on. That goes all the way through his work to give us this data to say, look, I've done my homework carefully. I'm giving you a chronological how it all happened that you can go and check out and investigate for yourself. That brings us to verse 4 in our final reason. Reason number 7, <clears throat> the aim of the accounts. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. <coughs> Theophilus, who he's writing to, we don't know much about Theophilus, but maybe he was a sceptic, a doubter. Maybe he'd heard something of Christianity, but he was... He's going, come on, is this really true? Did this really happen? And Luke is writing to say, look, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. The absolute certainty. And I am convinced that the Gospel writers don't write in a way that sort of says, oh, you just believe, just accept... They're writing and saying, look, we know that you're doubting. We know that you're sceptical. We're writing in a way to try and help you, to give you certainty. In fact, the word certainty here, this word certainty, it's a Greek word, asphilion. It's where we get the word asphalt from. So that you might have concrete bedrock certainty about what went on. I know it's crazy, I know it's weird, but Theo and anyone else is going to read this gospel. This really happened. This is really did happen. And I want to write in such a way to give you certainty. And I'm so grateful that that's the aim of the gospel. To help us believe. Help us have faith. Now, look, it mightn't be enough faith, um, evidence for you to have faith. But guys, and I, I can't produce all the evidence. I've only, and I've only given you a glimpse tonight. But I'm totally convinced when you join the dots, something happened in history. Something happened for all these disciples to go about preaching radically to their death. Something happened. There's a Jesus shaped dent in history. And I reckon there's enough evidence there to at least, hopefully, get you thinking about the Christian faith. And let me close with a very personal note, given uh, our, our last three months. I want to be able to look at people in the eye when I'm with them in their hours, hour of darkest need and say, look, I believe in a resurrection. I believe hope beyond the grave. I believe that Jesus will one day bring colour out of this terribly dark world. I believe in a new creation. I believe in hope. I believe in love. I believe in a God who loves us. And while I can't make sense of the world and what's going on at the moment, and the fact that even now in the boathouse where we've gone through such a heavy, hard time, it's because of this that I'm, I can have hope. And I can look at my brothers and sisters in Christ and say, there is hope, there is love, there is something beyond the grave, there's something tangible that we can hope in because I'm confident that we got a glimpse of the future in, in the past in Jesus.